This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first thousand people to sign up using the link in the description will get their first two months free. When we hear about incredible survival stories, we're usually referring to people who got lost in the wild, such as the recent case of the Ultra Runner who was hit by a sandstorm in the Sahara and survived for 10 days eating lizards and scorpions and occasionally finding some liquid relief in the form of dew. Then there's the guy who was swallowed by a sperm whale and lived to tell the tale. Or people who have taken as many as 20 bullets and survived. You might know that rapper 50 Cent took 9 and it didn't hold him back for long. Or what about the curious case of the Frenchman who as we speak lives a functional life with 90% of his brain missing. Today we'll talk about one of the greatest survivors in history in this episode of the infographic show, Phineas Gage, How Did He Survive? Phineas Gage has been called neuroscience's most famous patient, but who was he before he became a miracle of science? Not too much is known about his early life, only that he was born in New Hampshire, USA in 1823 and had four siblings. It's believed as a young man, he was strong, tall, and handsome. Notes found from one of his doctors when Gage was 25 tell us he possessed an iron will as well as an iron frame, a muscular system unusually well-developed. This might have been a reason why later he would become a living legend. This strong and durable fellow started working on the railroads in his 20s and soon became a blasting foreman. The railroads, of course, met with resistance in the form of nature and sometimes rocks needed to be blasted away. To do this, you packed them with explosives, but the packing itself was a hard job. To do that, you usually bore a deep hole in the rock and filled it with explosives. Once you had drilled the hole, you then put in the dynamite. But to make sure you really destroyed the rock from inside out, you then had to pack other materials, often clay or sand, firmly into the hole. To do this, the tool of choice was a tamping iron, which is basically an iron rod. On the fateful day of September 13th, 1848, this was the job of Phineas Gage when working on destroying rocks near Cavendish in Vermont. As the story goes, Gage was looking behind him where men were working. As he was about to speak, his tamping iron hit the rock, causing a spark. The explosives went off, and that tamping iron set off like a rocket in the direction of Gage's head. The measurements of the tamping iron were as follows. One and a fourth inches in diameter, three feet seven inches long, and 13 and a quarter pounds in weight. That's about half the length of a javelin and almost the weight of three crowbars. It's not something you want plunged into your face at high speed. The tamping iron went up through his jaw, past his cheekbone, behind his left eye, through the left side of his brain, and out the top of his skull. It said it was traveling with such a velocity that the tamping iron ended up some 80 feet away, now adorned with blood and bits of brain. Talk about an extreme form of lobotomy. But this strapping young man seemed to take the accident well, or should we say he took it on the chin well. While he did convulse, it said he soon sat up and talked, and within 30 minutes, with a bit of help, he made it to a chair. It was there he met with a physician called Edward H. Williams, who it said was subsequently given one of the great understatements of medical history. That line was the injured man saying, Doctor, here is business enough for you. The doctor later wrote, The top of the head appeared somewhat like an inverted funnel, as if some wedge-shaped body had passed from below upward. Mr. Gage, during the time I was examining this wound, was relating the manner in which he was injured to the bystanders. I did not believe Mr. Gage's statement at that time, but thought he was deceived. He was telling the truth, and to the doctor's astonishment, he added a bit more. He said after the incident he had vomited, but the strain of that vomiting had emitted bits of brain out of the top of his head. Gage's wounds were cleaned, some of his bones were reattached, while the holes were left partially open to allow for drainage. But what about Gage's mental state? Well, he was treated in the following months by a Dr. John Martin Harlow. Harlow first remarked on the patient's state the first few nights, writing, Mind clear, constant agitation of his legs, being alternately retracted and extended like the shafts of a fulling mill. Says he does not care to see his friends, as he shall be at work in a few days. As for his personality, many changes would happen as often happens to people who have suffered from serious brain trauma. The damage done, wrote the doctor, had seriously affected Gage's intellectual faculties and animal propensities. And at times, he wasn't just very rude to his friends, but on occasion, he would utter the grossest profanity. His mother said he couldn't remember a few things, but it wasn't all that notable. Still, even though he could at times say the most horrible things to a person's face, it didn't stop him from working. However, the railroad where he had previously worked Worked, didn't want him back despite him being a model foreman. So much for gratitude. The Smithsonian tells us that Gage, who became blind in one eye, later did some stable work in New Hampshire but even traveled as far as Chile to drive coaches. 
we guess horses were okay with being cursed at. Nonetheless, the wound proved too much for Gage, and at the age of 36, he died from seizures related to his injury. If anything good came of this, it's that medical science gained valuable information as to how brain injuries can cause changes in personality. Reports say that Gage's friends said he was no longer the same person, not even close. Once a man of mild and polite temperament, he became an ill-tempered, shiftless drunk. Other medical reports talk about how childish and animalistic he became, but also that he was incredibly whimsical. One doctor wrote that Gage was impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operations, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. If there is some vocabulary you don't understand in that, it basically means Gage's opinions or plans could turn on a dime. We should add that some other sources suggest that over time his behavior did improve, which gives some hope to people who have suffered traumatic brain injury. Regardless, doctors learned that even with a significant part of the brain gone, someone can complete tasks and live a relatively normal life. Okay, so Gage lost some of his inhibitions and could be impulsive, but he knew how to drive a carriage and not crash it. Even today, the story of Gage is still important when doctors discuss what role the frontal lobes play and how they are significant in terms of our behavior and personality. Why he survived is up for debate but it's thought that the fact he was already a very strong man played a part. Also important was the fact the object was sharp and made a clean exit through his skull. This lessened the shock to the organ inside. He was also fortunate that the brain could drain and he suffered no dangerous infections. Another reason, wrote a doctor, was the portion of the brain traversed was, for several reasons, the best fitted of any part of the cerebral substance to sustain the injury. In other words, if you're gonna lose some brain, lose that bit. He was lucky though, for sure. According to a story in the Baltimore Sun in 2018, about 20,000 Americans are shot in the head each year and die, which includes suicide. We are told if you get a bullet in the head, there is a 5% chance of survival, with only 3% of those people going on to live a fully functional life. If you want to see that famous skull, as well as the iron rod that did the damage, you should visit the Warren Anatomical Museum on the Harvard Medical School campus. Gage had given the bar to science what he called my iron bar, but later demanded it back, saying it was his constant companion. After he died, science took it back again, along with Gage's skull. Do you know what you would do in an emergency? If your first aid and survival skills are lacking, why not check out an online class on Skillshare, like how to save a life, learn CPR, and first aid in 10 minutes. As just one of over 20,000 classes offered by Skillshare, you can brush up on your emergency skills or perhaps pick up any number of new ones from art and design to self-defense. The first 1,000 people to visit Skillshare.com infographics34 or to click the link in the description will receive premium membership for two months completely free. Join Skillshare and start learning today. So, what do you think of this story? Do you know someone else who survived something equally atrocious? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called Why 2019 Will Be a Horrible Year. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.